I'm sure that when you looked at the program and you saw the title of this of my talk today, Pencils, Invisible Hands, and Broken Windows, you must have wondered, what in the heck is this guy going to talk about? Um, it seems kind of an odd title for an intro lecture into economics. But it actually fits in very well, because the pencil, the invisible hand, and the broken window are actually three very important demonstrations that have existed in economics that give you really a strong starting point for economic analysis. It really, these three little parables of sorts, uh, give us the foundation of understanding the economy, of where we're coming from, the world around us, and the subsequent topics that are going to be discussed here today. These are also three stories that are very old. The invisible hand goes back 250 years. The broken window story goes back more than 150 years. And the eye pencil story has been around for about 50 years. So they're very, uh, they're old, uh, but they're also trusted and sort of tested out stories in terms of giving us a feel for the economy, how it works, and why sometimes it doesn't. And in each case, with the pencil, the invisible hand, and the broken window, we have applications to what's going on in the world today that we can link these stories to so that we can get a feel for and understanding of what's really going on in the economy. Now, the invisible hand is the oldest of the stories. And this was inaugurated by an economist philosopher from Scotland named Adam Smith. And Smith used the phrase invisible hand to refer to how the market economy worked. He basically said that in terms of the economy and business people, that we could rely on their self-interest. All, all they had to do was to follow their self-interest, and no matter what they did, everything would turn out okay. That workers would be taken care of, that consumers would be taken care of, and we wouldn't have to have anything else. All we'd have to rely on is this invisible hand. Okay, and naturally, a lot of people are pretty skeptical about something like this, that we could trust business people to treat their workers and to treat their customers in the best possible way so as to provide an even distribution of income in society and to produce the best possible products at the lowest possible prices to create full employment in the economy and maximize what we now call GDP or GNP. And furthermore, not only was this invisible hand taking care of everybody in, everybody in the economy, everybody in society, but that all we had to do to grow economically and to increase prosperity is simply, all we had to do is want to be wealthier. Okay, so this invisible hand that Smith talks about is kind of suspicious. A lot of people don't trust this idea that all we have to do is let business people follow their self-interest. Because naturally we think, well, if they follow their self-interest, they don't want to pay workers. They'd rather have free workers. They don't want to make the best possible products. It takes too much effort. And so, despite the fact that the invisible hand is something that's been prominent in economics, it's also something that people have been highly suspicious of to this day. That businessmen or business people, you know, cheat their workers, they cheat their uh, stock owners, they uh, do bad by their customers, and so forth. Well, in the last few years, I've been working on a, 
an, an older economist than Adam Smith, actually, a guy named Richard Cantio, who was a banker in Paris and was, at the time, the wealthiest individual, private individual in the world. And he wrote a book about the economy. It was the first book about economics, and it was, came out before Adam Smith. And what I found in there that hadn't been found for a couple of hundred years was an actual description of what the invisible hand was. Because Smith didn't elaborate. He just said an invisible hand will take care of it. But Cantillon went through and looked at the sort of the nuts and bolts of the process of where this invisible hand was and what it really meant. And so in a couple of chapters in this book contains the mechanism of how the invisible hand actually works and why it works. So that the marketplace is indeed a self-regulated institution. And so what he says is that, okay, back in the days of feudalism, one person owned vast estates and everybody else had to work for this one person. And then Cantillon says, well, as time has progressed, these vast estates have been broken up into individual farms, and the estate owner or the king or the, the ruler of these areas would divide up his vast estates into farms, into individual properties for individual farmers who would pay rent. And then those farmers would grow crops and produce products, which would then be sold in the marketplace for money. And that as the tastes of consumers changed from one product to another, prices would change as a result. So that if people demanded more uh, carriages or, or things of that nature, then more horses would have to be raised and the price of hay would, go, would increase. And as a consequence, the, the price system would be such that it would direct resources to the direction in which consumers wanted those products. Ultimately, these individual farmers and entrepreneurs would have to participate in this price system. And some of them would succeed and others would fail. Uh, some farmers and, and entrepreneurs and craftsmen would make profits and others would make losses. The ones who made profits would thrive and expand and those who made losses would shrink, maybe go out of business. So the mechanisms underneath the market economy, which are driving the invisible hand, are things like private property, as individuals started to own property, the use of sound money, which in, that, in his day was silver coins, uh, markets, where goods and services are traded and exchanged, prices, which indicate products which are increasing in price, and products that are decreasing in price. And then finally, profit and loss. The ultimate foundation of the workings of the market economy is that some business people, farmers, producers, craftsmen, would make profits, and that would signal their success, and that they could expand their businesses, and other entrepreneurs, farmers, craftsmen would make losses and have to go out of business, we would go bankrupt and have to get a job in some other industry. So there actually is mechanisms that back up this invisible hand, that it's not just hand-waving, it's not just invisible, it is tangible. That the things like property rights, sound money, markets, prices, profit and loss, wealth and bankruptcy are very real in the real world. And it's what makes the market economy a self-regulating, automatic system by which the interests of everyone are taken into account as workers, as owners, as consumers. And we can see this in the real world because Smith's mes message about the invisible hand is, is that the marketplace, the free market, can be self-regulated. It doesn't need government regulation. And in fact, Smith points out elsewhere in his book, The Wealth of Nation, is that if we regulate certain businesses, that it can cause a lot of problems. 
So if we look around today at our economy and at the world economy, and we look at industries and markets that are regulated and industries and markets that are not regulated, what we find is that the regulated markets are actually the ones with the most problems. Okay, so with computers, laptops, televisions, tomato juice, whatever, flip-flops, hardly any regulation whatsoever. Hard to imagine, almost no regulation on flip-flops. And yet they're super abundant, they're low cost, they're almost seemingly an infinite infinite variety of these flip-flops and no government regulation. And then when we look at regulated markets where the government is supposed to be protecting us and protecting our property and protecting our environment and protecting our wealth, we find the most problems. For example, the regulation of banking, which we're having a lot of trouble with nowadays the, in terms of the big banks in, in New York and our money, things of that nature. And you hear a lot of people saying, well, we just need to regulate that stuff. We just need stricter regulations. Well, the simple fact of the matter is, is that banking, the stock market, and money are all highly regulated. You've got state regulators, you've got federal regulators. You've got the Federal Reserve regulating it. You've got the uh, comptroller of the currency regulating these financial markets. You've got the Securities and Exchange Commission regulating these markets. We've got multiple, multiple layers of regulations on the mark on that market of money and banking and securities, and that's where we see the most problems. Regulations, and I was a regulator myself. Regulate regulation is more of a confidence game. Government regulators never really solve the problem. They never really prevent bad things from happening. They are there just to give us confidence that somebody's looking out after them, that somebody's keeping track of everything. And that's simply not the case. Smith's invisible hand is what gives us real and true regulation of the economy and government regulators are simply a confidence game. Now, pencils. You all have probably picked up a pencil when you came in here. And there's really nothing more simple than a pencil in our economy. It's sort of almost outdated. I went into the grocery store of all places um, last weekend to get a pencil for a particular, uh, I was filling out a Scantron sheet for an exam and I didn't have a pencil, so I went to the grocery store for a pencil, and I got 20 pencils for 50 cents. They were on sale. But that's a really a great bargain. Uh, and yet, in reality, no one person knows how to make a pencil. As simple as this is, and as low cost as a pencil is, no one person can make a pencil. It, it's composed of a variety of parts. It's got an eraser, a little metal cap. Not sure why they have that cap there. And then there's wood and paint, lettering, graphite in the middle. And each stage of production is very complex in and of itself. Okay, so it's probably the case that no one even knows how to make the paint that goes on the outside of the pencil or knows where all the ingredients for that paint came from. Likewise with the wood, uh, likewise with the eraser, likewise with the graphite. Each of the in ingredients in he here come from different countries, different continents, produced by a variety of different people, so that it may take, a, in full total, tens of thousands of people working independently and cooperatively and competitively in order to bring about a pencil. Okay, so the, the people who produce the graphite may have no idea about who and where the eraser was made. And then when you bring all the ingredients together into a factory to produce it, 
Of course, the factory uses all sorts of complex machinery. And each of those machines was produced by different companies who were using different inputs, again, from different other firms. And so the whole complexity of what goes into making a pencil is precisely that complexity which brings down the cost to something that we can just give away for free. You guys can take those pencils home. So the complexity actually lends itself to progress, lower cost, lower price. And so what we see in the tendency in the marketplace is that over time, the process of production and distribution becomes more and more complex and the ultimate cost comes down and down and down. So that the longer a product is around, the lower the price of the product to the ultimate consumer, and very often a higher quality product as well. So the point of the pencil story is that there's a tremendous complexity in the market economy, far beyond what we can actually know. If you spend a year studying a particular marketplace, you might be able to get a good handle on exactly who was involved in the production of something. And what this means is that we are mutually interdependent upon one another, that we all depend upon each other in ways in which we cannot imagine. Now, lately, there's been an uproar about all of our manufacturing jobs going to China. And when people find out that the iPhone is made in China, they can't believe it. The iPhone is made in China. The $600 iPhone, which is the real selling cost, you get a discount if you subscribe to a service, is made in China. Actually, it's only assembled in China. The parts which go into an iPhone come from over 30 different companies in like 13 different countries. And all of those pieces are sent to China and assembled there and then shipped to the United States where we buy them up. The parts that go into an iPhone that come from more than a dozen different countries cost about $180 for the $600 iPhone. China gets about $10 for assembling the iPhone. So when Apple sells an iPhone, it makes about $410 of revenue. Not profit, but of revenue. All of the jobs in terms of assembling the iPhone in China are not high paying jobs. The high paying jobs are back in Cupertino, California at Apple. The people who come up with the ideas, the people who come up with the designs, as well as the people who come up with the sales strategy are the ones that are getting the high paying jobs. So we've got tens and tens and tens of thousands of people in the United States who are making upper middle income and high income salaries based on the iPhone. And it's been estimated that if we took the jobs of making the parts for the iPhone and we took the jobs in China of assembling the iPhone and we forced them all to come back to the United States, that the iPhone would cost somewhere between $1,200 and $1,500. Okay, so the idea of shipping jobs out to China is actually a great idea. We don't lose jobs by shipping jobs to China. We actually increase the number of jobs and we increase the incomes of the people who are producing the high value jobs of design, of prototyping, of sales and marketing strategies, distribution. Those are all high paying jobs 
where the jobs of putting little pieces together over in China are not high paying jobs. And finally, the broken window. Well, the broken window is a story about a little boy, a bad little boy, who throws a stone through a shopkeeper's window and breaks it. And there's a large crashing sound, and all of the neighboring businesses and households come out into the street to look at what this bad little boy has done. He's broken the window. The shopkeeper has to call in the, the window guy to fix the window. And somebody says at this gathering, he says, well, I mean, that's, you know, this is a, the silver lining of the story is the guy who fixes the window now is going to make $300. And then that guy with the $300 is going to go out and spend that money at somebody else's store. And then the guy, that store owner, has now got $300. He can go buy an iPhone or whatever. And so that $300 just keeps on circulating around the economy, creating employment for all of these people. And so what we need to do is to hire, find some bad little boys to go around breaking everybody's windows. I mean, think of it. We've got a big pile of rocks out there. And if we all got those rocks and started walking into downtown Auburn, smashing everybody's windows, think of all the employment that we'd have. Everybody would be making tons of money. Well, of course, that's ludicrous. I mean, it's sort of, there's a silver lining to it. You know, somebody's going to make the... The guy who fixes the windows is going to make some money. But you can't move an economy towards prosperity through destruction. And I have to admit, my fellow economists are some of the worst at this fallacy, that you can create prosperity by destruction. Because no matter what kind of natural disaster hits, if it's a tornado, if it's a hurricane, if it's an earthquake, or some kind of other natural disaster, and everybody's lamenting the destruction of property and the loss of life and the injuries, eventually they'll bring some economist out onto the, in front of the TV camera and they'll say, yeah, it's all such a shame, but it, it's going to create jobs because of all this destruction. You're going to have to rebuild everything. And that's the fallacy. It doesn't create jobs. It doesn't make us better off. It seems as if it's creating jobs because we can see people being hired to fix those broken windows. But the reality is, is that the person who had to pay for that broken window would have spent the money in some way, in any case, so that we would have that spending and that employment plus the windows. So this parable comes to us from a French economist 150 years ago named Frederick Bastiat. And he was constantly pressing the idea of the difference between what is seen and what is obvious and what is not seen and what is not so obvious, but upon reflection, is obviously true. We can't create prosperity through destruction. We have to look beyond the broken window and realize that that shopkeeper would have spent that $300 in some way or another, buying goods, buying services, uh, improving the business, hiring more workers, buying better machinery to create his products or services. So that money would have been spent on something. Because as you all know, you always spend your money in some way. You might save it in a bank, but then somebody's going to borrow that money and spend it. So all the money is eventually spent. 
Bastiat's story tells us to be vigilant against government policies that seem to create jobs. So he argues against the idea of trying to protect jobs through tariffs and protectionism. He argues against the idea of just using government money to create jobs for jobs' sake. He argues against the idea of immigration restrictions to protect domestic jobs because immigration actually increases jobs. It doesn't decrease jobs. It argues against things like cash for clunkers. Remember the policy last year where if you brought your clunker in, the government would give you a bunch of money, and then the government would destroy that vehicle. So the idea is we can create the sale of automobiles, jobs in the automobile industry, by destroying existing automobiles. Okay, so it, it never did create jobs. It was a temporary blip in automobile sales. Uh, but it didn't do anything for the long-run health of the U.S. economy. So, like Bastiat, remain vigilant against the fallacy of the broken window. Thank you very much.